Okay, so we're going we're gonna to start the show. Let's talk about financing. Mm-hmm. It is in the mind of lots of people. We have, we have some examples that we've, that we've brought in of financings that are, that are happening right now. But I would love to get a sense, not just in general, like out, out there in this world, but first of all, from the two of you, you're, you're starting, you realize I have X amount of runway or I'm about to hit X milestones. Talk to me from first principles, quote unquote, about how you plan it through. What do you begin with? Kevin, you can start. I would actually even take it a step uh, before that. Who should actually raise f- funding, venture funding? Mm-hmm. What types of companies? Why, do, why should you even raise it at all? What, what, what's its purpose? Got it. Its purpose is, is to build something that would have taken you capital um so that'll mm-hmm. be like your first angel seed round pre-seed round so that yeah. that could be a number of different companies it could be a direct to consumer uh company that could be uh that could even be a, a, a services a company or any type of type of company um but i think where what we're really what our experience is is in venture tech like funding yeah. so the reason that you raise the two million five million dollar seeds it is so you could hire a team so mm-hmm. you could you could build a product it takes engineers it takes whatever a mar- little marketing it takes whatever you you need to do so you could actually prove that you could get some users and yeah. then further scale it out so i, I it, think that you okay. should really understand what it's used for and mm-hmm. i can't uh say this enough you should take as little amount as you need to prove yeah. out what you have so the very Early first on. yeah well i would say for every stage to be clear mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. i think the very first stage is build a product get initial users figure yeah. out if they even like it or continue pivoting until you find some sort of fit with your product mm-hmm. that would be the seed stage the next stage is it'll be further on to further like expand grow use marketing dollars sales dollars um uh build a better product all that go up market all those other things um but i think that not all companies should raise venture um mm-hmm. and but we're specifically to all three of us have experience raising venture and, and we're, all of our companies today it's, are yeah, it's obviously it's well. a focus of the show where this type of founder this type of operator uh at the same time it's so difficult because it makes so much news, right? Yes. That it's like, oh, bam, people just raised, like 10 used to be a lot of money. It's no longer as, I guess. Now, Andy, from your perspective as a venture, as a person who was in a venture firm, how can you now look at a business and say, this should take venture capital or it should not? Give me your perspective. So let, let's start with why you should take venture capital, but even yeah. going a little step back. So I, I, there was a great tweet a couple of years ago from Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital. Josh mm-hmm. is a great venture capitalist. And he said it like this, I sell rocket fuel. Mm-hmm. And if you're not looking to buy rocket fuel, you shouldn't be talking to me. Inherent in the rocket fuel analogy, rockets crash. Mm-hmm. It's a different type of entrepreneurship. So this is going for, this is going for power law type outcomes. So when you take venture capital, you are looking to be the one in 100 company that dominates an industry. That's very different than bootstrapping or raising money from family and friends. Mm -hmm. The assumption is in a lot of other markets, you're going to be one of many and you can build a great business being cash cash flow positive and profitable. Mm-hmm. But in venture, the assumption is you're going to blitz scale. You're going to move as fast as possible. Yep. And I mean, that was the title of, of a partner at Greylock's book, Blitz yep. Scale. Three and so what type of businesses traditionally took venture capital, hard technology, software, yep. and biotech? That was what it lo- the industry looked like mm-hmm. probably before 2009. And yeah, inherent in that is consumer internet and consumer and internet also, and a few other sectors. Mm-hmm. And then somewhere along the way, it became a lot of tech enabled services For and sure. consumer brands mm-hmm. and kind of a mix of everything. But traditionally, you were building a marketplace, you're building a consumer internet business, software, 
hard tech or biotech. Economy there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, and a lot of uncertainties, typically moats. Yeah. Um, and then it changed. Yeah. Well, it, 2014, 2015 was the DTC era. And yeah. 95% of those mm -hmm. businesses should never have taken venture capital. Right. Or they could and have taken it. And you just have to know what less you're getting in for, right? Like it's it's interesting having spoken. You know, we, we've all started two or three. Joe, who's some often on the show, is it started three venture capital based businesses. Each time with like a sense of okay, we know what we're getting in for. Every second, every first time founder kind of misunderstands. They do. Okay, talk to me about that. Yeah. So Kevin, what are those misunderstandings? So I, I think that if you're taking venture capital, um, and even if, if you're going to YC or whatever, you start there, right? Like mm. you should be looking to own an industry. Um, you should be looking or create a new industry in, entirely. Like that should be your outcome. Otherwise, okay. you should take, if you do need financing, there are lots of companies that take some financing. Um, just take a lot less. So like yep. the way that I look at it is every round, your investors are going to to make them happy, which you definitely, like you have shareholders, stakeholders, mm -hmm. you should definitely look to make them happy, make them money. Like that should be the goal or one of the, one of the, your, your many goals, you probably have some personal goals, but you need to be able to return like your goal. If you're successful, 10 X, what they actually put in and whatever valuation they yeah. put, put in. Yeah. Like that, mm -hmm. that is a good rule of thumb. I think, mm -hmm. that, I think that's a good rule of thumb for, for every single round, right? Like if you, if you're a seed investor, um, you, you raised at, uh, 15 million posts, like for you to be a win, like you're seeing, you're going to have to like sell for $150 million. My standard is actually even higher than what you're describing. It's, and it's, it's really like, like, uh, I, I know that this has positives and negatives, but a lot of my early tech worldview comes from like the Peter Thiel kind of like world. And, uh, it is each investment should have an opportunity to return the fund. And so, of course, someone, right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So I thought the two were sort of, so you're saying it's got to give you 150 million. Well, it's $150 million if it's a very small venture fund. I think that's a, that's a good outcome for an investment. I think like how, how the funds, how, how funds return money to their LPs are based mm -hmm. on the outliers. The ones that if you are a series A fund that, that took a 500 X or a hundred X or something like that, like those are the fund returners. Yeah. But you should always, when you're looking to raise whatever round, like a good exit is going to be returning 10 times the amount um, to the investors at that stage. It's when I, when I started my last company breather, I, I looked at it and I said, there is zero chance I could do this without raising money. It requires in my, in my view, and probably still today, I was like, okay, well, we need to build software to connect with apps uh, with, with, with locks in a way that had never been done before. We need literally furniture for spaces, which costs thousands right. of dollars. We need to have right. a network. So I was like, and, and, by, and, and we worked really hard to get kind of a, a proof of concept of pen spaces in Canada, a few of them, and in New York with a million and a half dollars by, the, by the, the skin of our teeth to be able to be like, look, it's provable, right? right. It almost right. feels like the boundaries... You know, it feels that the standard has lowered over the past several years as people assume that the next round is just going to happen. And obviously that's not true. I see your eyebrows raising, Andy. Uh, what are you thinking? Well, I think it used to be, somebody said this to me the other day, it used to be that great operators would get capital and great and fund businesses. And that was what the venture capital industry was. And somewhere along the way, probably in 21, maybe in 2020, it changed to average operators got capital. That's true. Explore businesses. Mm -hmm. And the inherent, uh, the industry changed and expanded. And so now you have a lot of upper people in the industry who really aren't great operators and really haven't done this before and may not produce those outcomes. So it's just a very different yeah. mentality mm -hmm. than what it used to be. It's making me think, that the first job, the first time that you raise money is like to fake being a great operator, or at least to be convinced that you are one, even though you're not. But I the, was definitely not one the first fucking time, no doubt about it, you know? Yeah, Get but I think, yeah. I think that there, there's definitely like investors look for that 
that unknown is also very attractive to them because like yeah. what is the actual potential right this like, is a known this, entity this is an unknown entity i love it i'm excited by the mystery you know right like what is what is the the like from an investor's perspective so from an entrepreneur's perspective i think that you always at every single round you should be confident that you can like by taking on capital return 10 times mm -hmm. that amount or you should probably not raise it you should become yeah. profitable and you should mm -hmm. just run your business um, but from an, an investor's perspective, they're looking for the outsized returns. They are, they, they're not interested in the 10 X yeah. returns. They want much more than that. Unless it's a later stage investor, which 10 mm -hmm. X they'll be, they'll be happy with, but they're looking for the, the kind of the, maybe the crazy, uh, entrepreneurs that are going to be able to just figure all this stuff out. They're looking for mm -hmm. the high potential. So they yeah. don't, don't necessarily like you look at a lot of like, um, the, the people who have created uh, like unbelievable businesses are just a lot of first time founders. Like mm -hmm. you have the Mark Zuckerbergs, the, the even uh, Evan Spiegel's, like a, a mm -hmm. lot of those other ones. I think that's actually flipped a lot. <laughs> I think that now um, there's a lot more like re repeat founders are are much more likely. Probably if you look at like the, mm -hmm. the actual outcomes to produce yeah. like venture returning, um, the ones that return back in, into um, um, starting a venture back to business because they know what they're getting into. They're much mm -hmm. more likely, but there definitely is the unknown of like a new founder who is just kind of going to be naive, which is yeah. going into a certain industry. Like Julian, like you wouldn't go into the real estate industry again, right? You said yeah. that before, right? But, yeah. But, and I think, I think that, that as a founder, you do have this attitude of how hard can it possibly be? Like yeah. that that was did you have that perspective the first time that you did it? Andy, I see you nodding too. Oh God. I mean that was it, it just seemed easy. Yeah. I, how hard could it be to make consumer electronics, Julian? How it yeah, turns nobody... out it's really <laughs> hard. Uh, uh, it's the, the part that I, I that surprised this is a bit off topic. The part that surprised me about how hard it was, it is hard to raise money. That's true. Uh it is and you should have a superpower. You should kind of figure out what that superpower is, right? But and it the hardest part that I found, and I found the part that I found the most time uh, was the culture and the actual people. It turns out at scale, right? So right. it's maybe not raising money, but definitely at the beginning, you're like, you know, maybe you, we all take it for granted. The first round is a given, but it's not for most people, right? No, like it's not. They don't, they don't know how to do it. Okay. So then what is the advice that you give every single person when they're raising another round and how to do it. I know I have a playbook. I'm curious if you do. So basically, to, uh, think about the amount of dilution you're giving up. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to take 20% dilution, that's the minimum you need to now sell for on an increased evaluation basis. Minimum. And reality is those investors coming in, if it's a later stage, Series C stage deal, they're mm -hmm. expecting three to five times their money. Yeah. So if your company is worth 100, minimum you need to clear whatever that percentage basis was and most yeah. likely they want to sell you they're expecting you to build deliver them a 500 million dollar outcome yep and they don't really care if you want to take anything less mm -hmm. and so is there a way off the the, the treadmill once you're on it i, no. I wonder about there's this. not okay you actually believe there is there is no way because you know if you take one round i think about zapier a little bit these days yeah right yeah and i know some people that work there and and they raised a million dollars from angels, gave away no rights, which is unusual for venture. Right. And then raised nothing. They got bootstrap profitable. And now, and then Sequoia literally begged them for five years and, and then invested a hundred million dollars that I want to say was at least a billion dollar valuation. Right. So like the amount of control that they were able to retain. And these are, again, these are first time founders. They were able to retain that level of control. That's a way of kind of getting off the treadmill, but they wanted to stay fast growing, right? Software. So they were already in that sweet spot, is kind of my perspective, right? Somebody I know says it to me like this Once you take it, you're climbing a mountain. And uh -huh. when you're on Everest, there's really no way down but off the mountain. You have to go down. Mm -hmm. You can't right. get a helicopter to take you off. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are a few stories like that. Todd tells another one. I believe they took money from Andreessen and a note, gave them yeah. no rights, and yeah. basically have bootstrapped it the whole way through. Did you say Top Tell? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Top Tell, I believe, is the only other one I know that that, and yeah, there were, 
all the time there's an example of a company that raises three, four million dollars, doesn't need any more money, gets profitable, yeah. and just continues to grow. And, and keeps the question, retaining their trajectory and keeps staying top in the industry. Because yeah. if Zapier or Top TopTal is another good example. I've used them. We have a guy that we got from TopTal and is now full time. And and we look at people like that. And not only do you have to not take the capital and stay good, but you have to not take the capital and stay number one. Which when is you, when really your competitors tough, are raising. Are raising capital. Yes. yes. Exactly. And so that's the challenge. And it's almost like a psychological thing of, do I want to be on this train or not? And so thinking, thinking now, I, when I, I have a specific roadmap and lots of people come to me and say, can you help me with the deck or can you help me raise money? And I, I've done it for people that I've coached, obviously. And, and there is always a sequence. And I'll just say that my sequence always begins with your deck needs to be amazingly good. Andy, do you think the decks are as valuable as I think? I think it's so valuable. Um, okay. I, I think that, that, that is like a superpower of mine, building an amazing deck. Um, I started as an investment banker. That was my first job out of school. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different style deck that you'd make for a fundraise. For sure. An investment banker than yeah. you do to raise a venture. Yeah. And it's funny, as the later, the later you get in your business, the more it actually converges to a very traditional... <laughs> Yeah, uh, standard deck that you That's true. you'd use for any of type of capital raise. All metrics. But at the early stage, yeah. all metrics, similar slides, similar yeah. templates, the whole nine yards. Made by made and by a uh, made by a management consultant looking type of deck, but the, but the soon to be is, AI. That's right. It won't even be a person anymore. <laughs> now you just give into your sheet. metrics in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it will you seen Tome? Color. Be serious. I mean, I'm be, I think Kevin's joking, but Tome actually does. No, that I'm right being now. serious. I'm, I'm yeah. being totally serious. It didn't even occur to me, but I, I agree. At the I, early stage, it is an art. I, so I, I, I actually go even a step before that. Um, so what I have, so talking to other people I worked with before, fr or friends, mm -hmm. like, what, why are you even trying to raise money in the first place? Okay. Like, interesting. What, what is like? Should you be taking money on? Is this going to be a big business? Like if mm -hmm. you take on whatever, $5 million, like there, I think there's a lot of people out there. They just want to take venture for the sake of taking venture. And that could yeah. be like early stages. Cause like they just want to get a company going yeah. or that could also be like, well, I just want to raise more money because my competitors and it just feels good. I've definitely been in that situation before. Sure. I felt like yeah. I could, and like I was in this industry that was booming and you know i was in a hype cycle and it's like well we got to raise more money we have to mm -hmm. but it's like no like why like you you should have some unique worldview or experience or yes. or some yeah. talent that, that or you be know uniquely that, valuable which is the other way right yeah oh and you, and, and so you should be focused initially and i know that you obviously should pivot you could pivot and everything but you should start with like what are you actually building why is yeah. it differentiated why are you going to be 10 times better than everybody, mm -hmm. all the other solutions? How are you going to create a defensible moat, which is also yeah. extremely like, like talking about venture businesses, like you need to be defensible. You cannot be a, yeah. a business like in today's world, right? Like you can create AI, like you, be, uh, you could be a layer on top of AI and you're going to have a hundred different copycats mm -hmm. if you get something that works. Like you need to have, that 10 X better product. That's going to be defensible at scale. And that's what the reason that you should be going and raising that like 5 million, maybe you can raise like a smaller amount, like a million. If you're just trying to maybe mm -hmm. kind of play around with some stuff, you have an idea and, and you're just kind of want to iterate it a little bit, but like if you're raising like a proper round and a seed round or, or an a round, you should be raising it based off. Like I have a high confidence that this thing is actually going to work. And it's then you should pivot yeah. and try to f figure out product market fit as you. My my perspective is also because I I'm actually I know that if I had driven any here here any I'll just give you my perspective from my last business is like I came I I I built a whole mobile app okay yeah and I had zero spaces and zero customers of course but I had a mobile app I went through a whole financing someone agreed to lead my round I got a bunch of angel checks from Silicon Valley in New York. And not once did anyone ask me for the out. Literally not once. Right. And so now I advise people the same thing. When they're raising a seed round, I'm like, do not have any numbers. Nope. Don't have any. Yep. 
I literally that, totally. And if you have a number, and actually the practice deck is an example of this, and maybe all y'all have seen it, but the practice deck is an example of this. There was only one metric in it, or very few. And that that to me is it is so much an investor once told me who was on my board said, in the early stages, it really is about uh really driving excitement vision in, in terms yeah. of vision because that's really all you have and that's how you're going to prove to somebody that's a 10 billion dollar opportunity in the later stages it's like incremental in so much more of a way that i think i think people don't quite get and but, even i i wasn't good at that i wasn't but good how, at that transition. How about, so, so you're talking about yourself you've built breather up you raised hundreds of millions of dollars it, you're able to just raise on a deck how about for first time founders like yeah what, I, like, I was that first time founder but to tell you the truth i still believe that an idea has to be really ugly at the very beginning and that if you're going to do the venture thing then you're going to need that money in order to kind of polish it up like you're not you can't be everything you know did i design some stuff in 2005 when i had a blog like yeah is that going to pass in 2023 no i wrote fucking code when i was 18 is that am i going to be able to build a fucking mobile app no so like, I just need cash or one needs cash either from somewhere or from yourself. And this is the other thing is there's this assumption that like all the world out there is like, is like, oh yeah, I got 200 K from friends and family. Yeah. Like, the fuck are you that you have 200 K that your fucking friends <laughs> that is fucking very, have. That's like very I don't unusual. have friends or two. I do now, <laughs> but like, <laughs> you know, I was in the same boat. Julian's so you, ranting how he doesn't have friends with 200K. He's like, oh shit, now I actually do. <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't, I didn't then. And so I don't understand how people, it, there is this, there is this, oh, try not to, I get what you're saying, Kevin. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think like first time founders have, in many cases have nothing. I had nothing and it sounds like you did too. I, so for me, I, we built a product, but we didn't actually, we had like a couple users. So we didn't have real metrics, but yeah. it was like, we had a very unique idea. We we were mm -hmm. in also in the hype cycle. So we were the Uber for shipping. And yeah. we built like myself, uh, um, like I, I, I'm, I, back then I was an engineer. I did, I, for my, this company I didn't write any code, but like I built all of the initial like backend and app and everything. So like we, before we raised anything, um, we actually had a product that people could use a little bit just to show that like we, we could do something. And I think that's also, like, I think the, the YC, the, the framework that they lay out is good. Mm -hmm. um, while I don't agree with everything that YC does, um, I definitely do agree with, like, you should have an idea that's unique. You should build something. You should get, like, a couple users or something like that. But yeah. as far as soon as you start getting real metrics, then mm -hmm. you, you lose the unknown, like, what is the, the investor on the other side is going to be looking at what is the upside. If you, if you have, like, 100k in in revenue you're going to be measured off of that and yes. it, what's your growth rate and all yeah. of these other things like mm -hmm. early earlier stages is actually better to not have a lot of those things but i think if if you haven't done something before you don't have the credibility to build the company a product like you should build that first so i think it's different yeah. for everybody when yeah, you're first a, raising a, capital question for the panel quickly i want to know kevin and i want to know across everybody but i'll start with you do do we believe that YC's 6% is worth it? I know this is slightly off topic, but you mentioned them. That's why I'm asking. Don't make it a big thing. I just want to, I want to hear a kind of yes or no, maybe. Uh, I for think a specific just... type of... Oh, go ahead. No, no, Andy, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. For a f specific type of founder in a specific type of industry, I think it's incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, the folks at Sequoia will want to plug here because they now tell you to send them to the sequoia arch program instead of right. yeah. mm -hmm. yc but so there are other emerging models but i think it's there is a very specific type of founder that i say all the time go apply to yc got it typically younger typically first-time founder yeah mm -hmm. typically typically struggling to raise may need mm -hmm. a little iteration may need a little bit of help and a kick in the butt on the go-to-market yeah um and may just want the community of silicon valley Mm -hmm. And that's where I think YC is very worth it. I think for a lot of other businesses, it doesn't make any sense. I think Kevin, also I the companies that sell to YC. Wait, yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 so for me, yeah, younger founder, 
not you don't have any network so you didn't you didn't go to stanford you didn't he didn't go to mit Mm -hmm. you you don't know anybody in silicon valley i think like you're in another country like i think that that those are are reasons that you should probably go to yc another benefit is which i i i actually don't like this benefit that much but if you are a company that is selling into other yc companies you can get a little bit of a boost I would mm-hmm. say that's a crutch that later on is probably going to like hurt you because you'll mm-hmm. get some inflated numbers up front versus selling to just like an unknown people. But yeah. that can help you early on to get some capital and, and get moving and all those types of things. But I think if if like the reason I didn't do go into YC, I, I actually would be very interested to get somebody on, I guess, on here like um, Parker Conrad. I think he took Rippling through YC. Like, yeah. Like yeah, and that, I, I was actually that, that blows my mind. Yeah, right. I like was he, actually going to say exactly the same thing, and 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 there are a few reasons that I would I I did use to shit talk it because I think it that it takes six. Or I nine, did too. But yeah, but I no longer do, and I think it's because intensity is not a given, right? Yeah, intensity is is learned at YC if you don't have it already, and most people don't. Right. And the other thing is, is you get in front of everybody and actually even me, like we're all pretty networked over here. Yep. But I don't know fucking, I don't know fucking, I'll, you know, Mike Maples or some shit, you know, like, like, I don't know all those hundreds of people looking at YC companies and it would help. And, and the reality is, is, is you need a network and you need to not be isolated. And so returning, so YC might also help you raise, but then you're on your own. So what happens when you need to raise your second round? What happens? So, well, I want to go a step further. Yeah, yeah. Okay, did you, go. Did any of you apply to YC? Never. I did. I got rejected. My first show. So I applied with, I applied for Nanit. I also got rejected. And both of you ended up pretty all right and, and are, are making a decent job of it. I, I... Did yeah, you apply I don't for know if I would want the online I version. I for Airhouse. No fucking way. Yeah, I, I would go. not. Like, like with our networks and what we've raised, there's, I, I that's what my question. I would love to get like at the Parker Conrad's on the world to be to be like yeah. for one. Hey, hey, did you did you get into YC for like fifty basis points? Like, yeah. was there a side deal? <laughs> I was <laughs> having like, uh, breakfast in New York with uh, Zach Sims, who famously in Code Academy did go through YC and is highly networked in YC. Yeah, and I think he would probably he doesn't want to start a company again probably, uh, but uh, he would. I think he would again because the tightness that you have with those people, like I have the Andreessen Horowitz CEO mailing list, which is very high quality. But before yeah. that, I didn't really have that network in the same way. I know there are right. WhatsApp groups, but it's hard to find a really good network. I would also say that there the the downsides of going into YC is are, are that for one. It, it can be a crutch. You could sell into other people in their network that are mm-hmm. not going to be real customers, essentially. Like you have to figure yeah, out that or muscle. shitty customers when they're a company to die or whatever, you know? Uh, maybe. But but also, if you're not one of the top companies, it actually could make it harder to raise. So like you're one out of 600 companies yeah. and like you're going to be going to demo day. And if you're not one of the top 20 or mm-hmm. 30 or whatever, like though there's, I'm sure that like two thirds of those companies just go nowhere. I'm I, mean, I, I totally agree with that philosophy, but if you're not going to be one of the top YC companies, like, guess what the rest of the real fucking world is like, my man? Oh, totally. Like, it's shitty out there. And I mean, I got a pretty decent company with pretty decent numbers and decent amount of capital, but like, I'm, I'm looking out in the world and I'm going, it ain't fucking easy out there. You think YC is tough? Holy shit, get real. Yeah. And if, if you can't do, make it work, Go join another if you are a talented yeah, engineer, join the number designer, one fucking YT company. Absolutely. Yeah, go do it. And then if you want to eventually go and build your own thing, get that tool set, get that network. Mm-hmm. I think that is such an undervalued value thing. I I wish I would have done that right out of. I, I wish possible? I wouldn't even went to college. I and just like yeah. taught myself programming and just went to yeah, work me for too. one of those yeah. series. A, I do series think about B that companies. sometimes, thinking like, oh, I should I should have just. Like I, I learned to code very young, but then there was this whole phase where I was doing a bunch of bullshit and I wish I had kind of started earlier. I don't know that it's my calling exactly. But I, you know, I do like this business. It definitely you know? is for me. I would not do anything else. Yeah. And I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to be in technology for the, my entire career. Yeah. It is exciting and you meet a lot of cool people. Andy, uh, uh, you were a banker. Do you feel this is your calling now? 
I fin- I was a tech banker. I was a VC. Um, I'll be in tech to some degree. I don't know if it's my calling per se. Mm-hmm. I kind of just like building things and what, yep. whatever that is. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's necessarily in tech. I have a very strong interest in yeah. some upper domains too, but in this ecosystem, most likely. So I would like to do YC. I've never done it. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to for Vowel. Um, and we applied and we were accepted. Uh, huh, really? Yeah. And what so, happened? It was like April 2020. The mm-hmm. world was the world had ended already. Uh, we were all locked at home. And it was like their first virtual batch. Oh, yeah. And the virtual ones suck, probably. I don't know. Uh, I spoke to a lot of people and ultimately we decided not to do it. Um, mm-hmm. I probably wish I would have done it um, in, if it was in person just for the network, honestly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I still wish I kind of have done it. I have a lot of friends who did it, um, but I wasn't sure that it was the accelerator that I needed at that time. Yeah. I need the rocket fuel. For this they, business, they did have come good on. Principles. The six percent was was digging at you too as a banker. Come on, that it was that was six. It was the six percent plus the fact that we raised with oh, we raised without it, and so then the question right, right. for us, yeah. mm-hmm. right. what is the valuation collection you're going to get for that six percent? Yeah, and it had to be something that you would have to be the top. Oh, 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 one percent of a YC, a YC based company on valuation of what you raise. Can, can we can we take that and pivot to like that? That right there is how companies die um, is OK, is where you, you get that like huge valuation so early on and yeah. you just can't live into it. And so this is very timely um, mm-hmm. today. Right. We're yeah. in 2022, January. There are so many zombie companies that raise huge rounds uh, before product market fit. We know some of them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yes. And they are going to die a slow death. They they are are using capital to like try to fix things. They're over hiring. They're hiring. They have have, have probably very expensive executives. They don't have product market fit. Like Mm -hmm. they are like, this is what happened to me at Chip. Um, And like, it, it it's like the yc effect like oh like and that's one of the reasons i don't like yc is like everything's like valuation focus like get the highest valuation like we're raising in a 25 or a 25 mil like cap no no and like all like say, safe and like that that's what they're focused on and like mm-hmm. all these investor tricks and all this stuff and like yeah that's cool but like you need to live up until that to, to that and like that early on i'm sorry there, it's just impossible to tell if you actually can deliver on that and so that's yeah. why i am very strict on like for every round doesn't matter what it is make okay. sure that you can develop deliver 10x of what your actual valuation that you're raising at question how in the early stages how the fuck are you even gonna know that but first of all the existing value is zero but but in on top of that how do you have that confidence? Because I'll tell you, I have a slightly different perspective. My perspective is, is investors should take a, sh- ha- ha- they do shots on goal and they're a shots on goal type of business and they're going to find the right shots on goal. I have confidence in myself, yeah. but I'm not like, oh my God, I need to, in, I, I, I respect in, investors that have put money into my company and I've worked very hard to return capital and more. But that said, it is a shots on goal business and they have a basket. It is not my job to commit suicide in, in terms of workload in order to fulfill that basket's uh, expectation. So I've invested in a bunch of YC companies. I'll take the other side of Kevin. Uh, I have a bunch of friends who've done YC. Maybe I'm good at picking. Maybe I'm very picky on the ideas that I'll I'll invest in, but the YC companies that I know and my friends have done have done significantly better than the average company out there. Yeah. So there is something sure. to it. Oh, of course. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. they're the top companies in the batch and look, they're 600 or 400, yeah. whatever it is right now. So we're, t- we're it's a little bit different and it's survivor bias has it at, at its best yeah. by it totally definition. Is. There's 600 companies it, in the bat in every batch. Come on now. Yeah. 
I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I, they produce a lot of good entrepreneurs and a lot of good companies. Um, they do, they do. If, if you're bad, well, for the most part, they just won't take you, right? And obviously there's exceptions, but it does, because early stage is so emotional, you're just like, I like this, I don't like it. I like it, I don't like it. As an investor, it's really, this is one of the reasons it's so important to write at least one check in your life so that you really yeah. understand what it is like to accept a company and accept the risk, or right. reject a company and reject the risk, really viscerally. And, and that, because the, the line between a yes and no is so thin, YC is like, yeah, sure, fuck it. I've seen a lot of people who struggle to raise at like a six cap with a good business, yeah. go into YC, and all of a sudden be the hot company in YC and the same investor who a month ago yeah. was sitting there saying, I didn't want to invest at six, now wants to invest at 25. Literally, so this is why I know I'm a good changed. fundraiser. Totally. It's, that, is, that, that really gets to me, but I understand that that's the game. It, well, it's a that's signaling game. That's a lot for first-time founders. It it's is. a signaling it game. It, it's it's all signal. It's who else is investing. You need to build momentum with investors, and then mm. eventually, and then in, and then with customers, and later on, that's more important. Early days, it's a dream. All of this. Do you guys want to move? Because because we obviously like that's we've talked, we've talked early stage, but like why don't we talk about like later stage rounds? Like Julian, okay. I think you're you there is there is the a topic capital. here on signal, Kevin, which I really want to get to, which we yes, talked about in the it. WhatsApp. And you can get to it. I, I go through your thing, but let's not forget about the discussion of fake term sheets. So let's go to the later yeah. stage. Go ahead. You can drive it. So I think that um, for a Series A company, that, that you're really like, you've got a product, you're, you're, you're looking to really figure out, find, Series A is about, you have a product that some customers like, you want to try to find product market fit. What product market fit really is, is like the, the, the market is pulling the product from you you mm -hmm. are growing at a good growth rate. So it's going to be probably about 200% at, at minimum today, these days, a, a year, minimum, probably 300, at, at, probably 300% year, mm -hmm. year on year. Um, and you're looking to get some rocket fuel um, to kind of go in, into that Series B, which a Series B is, I now have a predictable go-to-market uh, function right. that I can put $1 in, and get a dollar fifty out. That's mm -hmm. that's what it is. And then it gets just bigger numbers as you go into the different series C and D and E, and then eventually public and all those different things. Yep. So that's the framework that I kind of think th think of. So uh, where C is all about the idea, the vision, the the what have you done before, um, all of those different things. The Series A is you've got a product that people actually do like. You've you've built it, um, and you're looking to build that that go to market function. And then everything else is just like rocket fuel. So your Series A fundraise is as much different. It is going to be metrics focused. It's going to be a lot on growth, but it's probably yeah. going to be around a lot, a lot, a lot around like you don't have the specific like growth channels to like totally figure it out or something like that. You you have like some inklings and, and you have some probably good retention metrics and the numbers are probably still quite small. So mm -hmm. I think rule of thumb is like, you're looking to, if you're a B2B business, like a million dollars ARR, uh, at least today, probably yeah. it's up to maybe 2 million. Yeah. Um, and, it and yeah, velocity, velocity. Yeah, you've got some velocity, but you haven't figured out like your marketing team and all, you're not able to predictably like grow. That's what the, so, the Series B and C is for. You have, you have very, very good structure for what is right. It is so weird though, to be able to go into a financing and to know, and I, I think we all across the panel here, we know that the answer is, it's whatever the fucking guy thinks is good enough. And so at 100K, true. your fucking Series A can get done, yep. even in this market. If fucking one guy is like, you know what, fuck it. You happen to hit John Doer or whoever that has some power and is willing to do it. That's just how it happens in this world at the early stage. Andy, right. you're leaning in. Uh, I was just leaning towards the mic, <laughs> literally leaning in. No comment, no comment. <laughs> it's, uh, in, in, you're right about those milestones. And the better of a fundraiser you are, the more you could still make it art instead of science. The you worst can. of a fundraising you are, 
the the more is up and to the right, which is what I used to say to people. I used to be like, series A, up and to the right or kill yourself, All right? Well, so Jillian, do you tell people who come to you for advice, don't take venture capital, go bootstrap this business? Almost never. I just oh, assume so that I do it a do lot. It. Okay, yeah. And so what, what are the, how can you tell? Almost anything DTC. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost anything sort of consumery. Almost mm -hmm. anything that private equity is very established in. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you can just kind of look and see there is 100 private equity portfolio companies already in the industry. You should probably mm -hmm. be the 101, not the venture back model. Uh, there's just a lot. It, it's very interesting that, to answer that question. It's case by case basis, but I feel like it comes up once out of every five times where I sit there to say something, you should huh. be raising VC. It, but I also yeah. tell it how it is. So if anyone wants to get uh, their dream crushed, call me. Um, mm -hmm. But I also have a very, I think I have a very real view on what venture capital is. It's, it's meant for some yes. other companies. And I, I like it you. Is. And I think from the two of you, to a degree, I've actually learned more about incremental, the incremental that customer has to cause zero. Like that's like, that's, that's the scale that you're looking for. And, yep. and. Uh, we return to uh, one of Peter Thiel's maxims. He's definitely not right about everything, but he is right about tech. And uh, there are four ways that you produce a moat and four things that are really going to drive out outsized return. And the fourth one is a bit controversial. So one of them is, I believe, 10x technology. And what does that mean? Okay. And yep. there's double nods right here on the panel. So I'd say product. I'd say 10x yeah, product. product. 10x product. product. 10x Let's say the example of 10x is is product is foul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a product that's disproportionately different. And your AI thing, your AI um, synthesis thing that you published a couple of weeks ago, Andy, is a good example in my mind. Yeah. It blew my mind, and I think it blew everyone's pet, everyone's mind when they saw it. The other one Thank you. is network effects, yep. which is distinct from 10x technology. The technology could be crap, but the network effect is so strong that people are like, "Wow, this is." And, and Airbnb is the perfect global example. And uh, and Uber at the time was the perfect local example. I'm not sure yep. if it still is. Then the third one is economies of scale, which is, okay, you are selling so many of these things at such a small cost because uh, you're, you're making them at such a small cost because the incremental next one is so, you've done so many of them that, uh, that incremental next one is costing almost nothing to produce, and you're producing a much higher margin, let's say, than the next thing. And then the and final think, one, go ahead, after you. And I think economies of scale has been the one that's been the biggest fallacy in Silicon Valley, that yeah. it doesn't end up happening. So, I mean, I remember the seed deck for Nanit. I knew what the minimum water quantity we would have to get to to make it a great business. We right. got there, but I know most people most don't. Most of them Yeah, I'm just thinking about it, and I'm going... You're better than 99% of founders just for having that number. Even if it was bullshit, most people don't know a fucking thing about them. Right? <laughs> How bad are the founders you interact with? Bro, I don't think, first of all, I was a piece of shit when I started that last company. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Dude, they were like, he wrote a bestseller. He was on some podcasts. Yeah, sure. It, it, I don't know if I would have succeeded as a founder, <laughs> as a first-time founder in this ecosystem today. I'm just, I'm just being honest, you know? Turns out I'm okay because I'm a really good communicator, but nobody would have known that then. If you're selling something, you should know what it costs you to make and what you have to. I'll go on the record and say it. For <laughs> everyone here who's listening and wants to be an entrepreneur, if you're selling something, you should know what it costs to make and rule of thumb, sell it at 3x the cost. Yeah, I, 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 I wish all of you luck listening to this. Uh, the fourth one is brand, which is surprising. Uh, Peter Thiel believes that brand is a moat. I agree. And, and I agree. I believe in that. Yeah. You, wow. Okay. So you guys have a stronger, I think I'm a better brander than a lot of people. And I still doubt it. I, I think that, that you have to, for the best companies, they, they have uh, at least three of these things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that like, if, if you have, if all things else are equal, brand can be the differentiator um between like the winner and the second place winner but like brand alone is not going to get you anywhere right if you don't and have yeah. a ten, if, if, like i think it's it, you have to have a 10x better product and i think also network effects like that 
if you have network effects, uh, like that, that makes you that that is your product as well. Like Airbnb, mm-hmm. like they have network effects, and that makes the product better because you could go in anywhere in the world, and like that. That so they kind of combine. So I think you have to have at least three of those to be like one of the the winners in like like a true venture backable um, mm-hmm. like public company. You have to have three, at least three, if not so four. I would in, say in this second financing now. Can you, and when you look at other people that have done it, and when you look at yourself and you say, am I going to be able to do this financing upcoming? Do you believe that your hit rate is good? I'll give you an example of just from my last financing. I showed my numbers in the early stage to one of my angels, one of my New York angels who sold a company and did a really high valuation, it turns out. And he was like, I don't know that you can get a financing done, he said. To me. Yeah. And this because was last he lives year. in New York. This was in, yeah, it's in New York. But it's, it's, but he, yeah. he's a, like, like I had a hot set of fucking super angels on my cap table, right? I, and, and importantly, I knew maybe that I would be able to tell a good story. And then people were like, yeah, maybe you're going to get five. I don't know. You get four. I had 17 million in my, in the cloud, like waiting for this round at the end. And so my question is, can you predict whether a fundraising will be successful ahead of time? I, I think I can, actually. I, yeah, I, totally. have, I, I, I probably could have told you it would have been successful. But I think listening to somebody who's, you brought up a very interesting point that's just like a whole different animal. New York is very different from the West Coast. Yes. And there's a reason that New York Angel told you if you had gone to a bunch of New York based VC firms, you probably wouldn't have gotten that type of demand. But mm-hmm. on the West Coast, it's it's just a different style of investing. I think New York based funds mostly focus on and I'm going to USB does it correctly. It's how what's the risk? And the West Coast mm-hmm. funds really focused on if this is right. Yeah. How what's the big upside? can it be? Yeah, yep. because the reality is, is you're only going to ever lose the amount of money you put in, mm-hmm. but the amount of money you can make is infinite in venture, mm-hmm. and it takes a lot of people a lot of time to actually realize this. It, th- this is why I totally agree. I, I this was t- transformative in my life when I went to Silicon Valley, and I knew almost no venture firms, but I knew some high value angels, and I I'll never forget Mike Walsh was one of them. Was one of the first investors in Uber. And I'm like, yeah, so I'm going to basically come up with this thing. It's going to be spaces. You know, there's going to be an app. He's like, sounds good. 100K. Like, just like that. And it, I was like, I just left the, 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 the thing. I was like, what the fuck just happened? It made my head spin. And only in Silicon Valley is it like that. Right? Yeah. I think there's some Silicon yes. Valley people who have relocated to New York. There are a couple of them. I mm-hmm. think some of those people live in Miami now. Uh, okay. <laughs> and Austin, Texas, but you have to be trained in Silicon Valley. You have to think a certain way. I think it's a mindset. A lot of also, folks. It, it, it's a, it's a mindset. Um, and yeah, a lot of people have moved away. Also, I think there's a resurgence in people living in, in Silicon Valley. Um, mm-hmm. I, I definitely would tell everybody if you're building a tech company to, to be located here, including both of you, you should be located here. As I've told you before, both before. There's just and so I've many heard benefits. There's cheap rent on Market Street for where you could touch your company. <laughs> yeah, for a good but, reason. But whatever. <laughs> li- live in a small place. Who cares? You're trying to build the net. Like you're look like you're, you're you're trying to build. Like if you're truly in venture and you know you're getting into, and we all do. Like you're trying to build like a ten billion dollar company. That's what you're trying to do. If you're not trying to do that, you should not be taking fucking Series B checks or Series C checks or anything like that. And so, like, you should, you should, in my opinion, and, and you guys may not agree, like, you should be here. I think it just makes things just a lot easier. Um, I, I, your argument is, honestly, without being flippant, is, is very strong, and I have thought about it many times. I, I would move back to Silicon Valley if it wasn't for my partner. Um, she has a large say in things, though. So if mm. anyone knows her in real life, please try to convince her. I, uh, I do know her in real life now. <laughs> And, and I can see that, uh, the, uh, now I want to bring us to this discussion of yes. the, this, this, first of all, the, the conversation this week was rabbit on the WhatsApp and, and it was us talking about like, holy people are and or were, or are, uh, uh, talking about 
I have a term sheet saying to an investor, I have a term sheet when they do not. And I, I think we went across the panel. Joe is not here today, but he was also really clear that uh, we were in a private group is what we were saying. None of us, we were all like, I would not do that. I specifically, I know my, I'm rigorously honest, almost to a fault. And, and so I have definitely said like, yeah, we got a deal coming and really believed it, but never have I said uh, that I had a term sheet when I didn't, but apparently it is common and you both believe that it is done often. Also, and I, I won't say who named this out, that that uh, some apparently some VC firms tell their por portfolio companies to tell other yeah. um, people that they're raising that they have a term sheet when they don't. I think mm -hmm. that this is just that that is just a poor like it was just a flat out line. I, I think that when you're fundraising, and also there's a lot there's a lot of securities law in this as well. Like telling yeah. people you have a term sheet when you don't, I don't know, gray area if that is like securities, like that that, that is illegal or whatever. But like what you can't do in a fundraise is that you cannot lie about your past metrics. Mm -hmm. You have to be totally upfront, give one hundred percent transparency in your deck, in your in your data room, all that. It has to be 100% legit. Where mm -hmm. you do have some leeway is when you are dreaming about the future, your projections, where the company could go, all of those things. You can be be kind of, and this is where I think the great fundraisers can, can really shine. It's like, mm -hmm. we do this, this, and this, and we get to hear, this is how we'll, we'll be able to conquer this market or this market or the this is, these are the things that we're, we're going to do with this capital. This is why we're raising capital, all yep. these things. I, I th but I think I, I look at them completely separate. And for me, I would never, my, the race for me is really to get the first term sheet so I could tell people that I have a first term sheet, but I right. would never, ever, even because I think the, this is the, your career and uh, like the like life is long. You should not be t trying to take shortcuts. Yeah. Like, don't try to cheat the system here. Don't lie at all during your fundraise about what you have today or any of your past metrics or any, anything like that. It is, there, there is this discussion of the internal term sheet. I've definitely gotten internal term sheets from people. When I got them, they were real. And they were like, we yeah. will do this deal. We would prefer if someone else did it, but we that's will do sheet. this deal. That, that, that's a term sheet. Right, exactly. Uh, and um. And I know we're coming up on time and I, we have real jobs, so I want to be conscious of this, but like how, how much from your perspective, cause I see all these people talking to me all the fucking time. Like it won't be happening anymore, but they were like, oh yeah, I got five term sheets less from like, what the fuck? I, they were lying. Yeah. I they were lying. lying. I think they're lying. Okay. Have you I ever gotten that, five term sheets? Has that ever happened? I've never got I, the most I have gotten is two. Mm-hmm. Why are you keep no, going three, after three, three, well, three? After three, what were you looking for? I know. Yeah, that's a great question. It's interesting. I, I'll just be, I'll be open about the way that this thing went with Andreessen and Horowitz last time is they were like, we will do this deal. And I was, and I was like, yeah, because to give me a term sheet, they were like, we are telling you that we would do this deal. If you want to accept it, let us know. We'll put it in paper. And yeah, I was that, like, that's what all the good VCs do. That's what yeah, John Doerr did for me to a Kleiner. Mm -hmm. Tell me you want to work with me and then I'll write it up so you don't go out and shop me. That's, that's the, the point. And when I happen to me, because that's, that's how I recruit people, by the way, I do the same thing. Are you ready to work with, work with us? We'd be super excited to work with you. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's your offer. Right? But oh, also, good. I haven't the, done that for recruiting. The, so, uh, so actually, no, I, 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 I lied for a second. I do know somebody that's gotten multiple term sheets. This, that's, this is Travis from Uber. He actually gave me like great the, the fundraising advice. He, and, but he was in a, like a very save unusual. Save this for the last minute of the podcast. Sorry. Tell us the advice. The, do you know well, Travis his, from his, Uber? <laughs> yeah, no, a little bit. Um, Why so is he out on the he, show? Uh, he doesn't do anything like this. He doesn't um, do anything. No, no. Um, so. He was basically like, like they were, they were in a point where they were in super hype cycle, top dominating company. Like they had so many people and he's just basically like, he shops everything around. He's like, mm -hmm. get, he's like, do everything you need to do, get the first term sheet. And then you go to all the other people and you say, it's this, the price needs to be at least this because mm -hmm. I have other offers. And he, he legit had like five or six other term sheets. And then yeah. he, he also, I think, um, 
he he looked for he was trying to optimize for valuation at that the I think this is the series uh B. It so was he's, Menlo. He's, he's, Menlo led it. I remember. Yeah, Menlo story. did. Yeah. 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 Um Good and so Shervin. Yeah, Shervin. Um it was. So, so it was really about the valuation for him. So he yeah. did bounce back, but but also like he had like he, he founded two other venture back companies. Like he was extremely good at fundraising, probably one of the best fundraisers out there. So mm-hmm. he was able to do something like this. Um, but most people, when they say they have five or anything like that, are complete, yeah. is complete bullshit because those good venture capitals is exactly right. Like with John Doerr, like he didn't allow me to shop it around. He's basically right. like, and he, he was obviously bluffing. Like it's not like if I'm like, no, like I'm going to go and talk yeah. to other people. Like I'm sure he still would have done the deal at, at Chip, but like, He's like, no, like, I want to know, like, if you really want to work with me, like, look, here, like, here it is. What here's a good price. Like, there's no mm-hmm. reason that you should be doing it. And and also, like, more or less, the deal goes away. Like, on, he didn't, he did not say this specifically. Some, some VCs are like, the deal goes away by, by this date. But it was more or less like that was implied as it should be as a good VC. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't get a lot of those different, there's not most rounds. If, if they get done, they have a single term sheet. Always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, it's, that's my experience. People that I've coached through financings, which is, you inevitably end up doing it with everybody. If you've worked with them long enough, it, it's been like two or three in really, really, really hot rounds. Yeah. Like, why are you continuing? Right. Oh, it is. Well, well, no, sometimes it, it depends. Like I'd also say a good, a good strategy is to like, when you're fundraising, you should talk to the people that you're probably less interested in working with as like a mm-hmm. lead investor first try to get that very first term sheet and then have the, the next round of investors you're going to be talking to the ones that you truly if you, if you have a, re, a really hot company so you mm-hmm. you you should try to optimize a, like to get the best fit at, from an investor perspective as well so you yes. should try to optimize but there's a there's a lot of like there's not a lot of written term sheets. That That's the thing. There's a lot of right. verbal, like, we'll do this, all of this. But you should kind of navigate towards the person and the partner, more specifically the partner and the yeah. firm that you want to work with um, versus trying to just stack up all these term sheets. We have 10 Andy, term sheets. Closing thought? Choose the person you want to work with, not the firm. Yeah, go at them hard. Go after a list of three or four top people. Just go at them. And build relationships. short. Yeah. And build relationships with them over years. Try yeah. like that's another like mm-hmm. a, a, like for first time founders probably unrealistic, but like I try to to talk to people over over many years and mm-hmm. try to really get to know them on the same way they want to get to know you. All of that and yeah. like this is it's like a marriage. It really is. But also sometimes it doesn't work out, and sometimes you take the person, and then you should after you sign a term sh- or. Or no, before you sign a term sheet, you should go deep into their references. You should Super go deep. spend yeah. like three or four dinners with them. Like yeah. you should really, truly understand what their motivations are, how they are on other boards. Yeah. Are they a good fit for you? Do they understand do they, your business? Do like, they have what a do second you, check policy? Will they automatically write another one after if things go sour? Right. That type of thing. Right. right. Serious stuff for when you're actually operating because it's not sexy. It's not. And times are going to get tough. And you want that person to, mm. if, you, if you have executed, to have your back. Because yeah. also, for, to, for their firm, like, they're the ones that if you do need to get a bridge round or something like that, they have to go and argue with their firm and try to get that mm-hmm. other check. It's not like yep. it's not up to them. They're in a partnership. You need to have somebody that's going to be able to, to hopefully, like, when time... And also, this is also another inside baseball piece. Like, I, I would recommend people try not to go to the major firms for like a series A check. Like there is a, like, a, uh, so the Andreessen's of the world, like I, 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 not that I wouldn't have taken their money for a series A. Um, we didn't have, I think at that time they were looking mostly at fin, crypto and fintech. So I didn't even think we got to, to actually even pitch them, which is crazy. Cause I built, cause also this is very frustrating for me. I built like really great relationships over the years with like many Andreessen partners. And then they're like, ah, oh, no, <laughs> not even interested in talking. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so, I've been there. Yeah, so, I so I, 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 yeah. Um, uh, so, um, I lost my train of thought, but any, any, anyways, um, wait, what was, <laughs> yeah, you got a great business. So you should have nothing to complain about you, closing thoughts, Kevin. I think I think that 
know what you're going to do with whatever you're if you're raising know what you're going to do with capital truly know with what you're yeah. going to do don't just do it because you could raise don't raise it to don't optimize your valuation i think that kills companies take mm-hmm. a fair valuation at the end of the day an extra like five percent of the company you own does not is not going to matter you should no. not optimize and also, this is also it goes back to um mm-hmm. i think it was um who, who do we have on here uh, that, that said that um it was william from platt he was like yeah, william, it's, yeah. it's it's not the opt that optimizing for for dilution does not matter like early early rounds you're going to get your your biggest dilution hits um and also build relationships up with with um different investors over time think of this mm-hmm. as uh, this is your career like like this is the way i look at it Good i'm not getting out of this i'm gonna mm-hmm. my goal is to take I'm a company here. public um and build a generational hopefully like like a uh, category winning company and so you you need to really n- navigate the relationships be honest but also you need to sell the shit out of your company as well so you mm-hmm. you should like with your vision um like everything in the past you need to be honest about everything in the future it has to be realistic and what you're actually going to do Yep. But you would it's your job to really paint that picture of what it could become if a lot of things go right. Um, I think and also the, don't like realize that when you're signing up for that next round, whatever it is, investors ex- expect a 10x return. That is a good outcome. It's not a, an amazing outcome. It's not a fund returner. And so make sure that that if if you cannot produce that, which a lot of companies can't, then maybe look to go sell sell your business somewhere or get profitable and then continue and to, to, to go on, but don't take that next round. If you're not realistically going to be able to produce those results because you're, thank, you will be in the world for a hurt. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're over time, but it's been an enthusiastic, uh, hour of chatting with all of you. See you next week. Uh, Thanks don't, for listening. Uh, tell people that you have a term sheet when you don't. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Second time founders podcast. Talking tech news. The show is a must. Not some billionaire trying to sell you their book. We're coming from a real place. Plenty ups and downs. Got some insights. Join the discussion now. We being honest and raw. Giving you real talk. We've been at the bottom and made it happen and much more. The second time founders podcast. More building, less talk.